Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, your host for this edition, episode 35 of the EV Revolution Show. Thank you very much for taking some time out of your busy schedules to sit with me for a few minutes and watch my show and listen to what I have to say about what's going on in the EV landscape uh, from the last show over the last few days and this week. So let me get right into the top story today. Well, it's Tesla. Tesla came out last night with the Model Y reveal. Um, I actually did stay up to watch it, and um, I have to admit I wasn't overly impressed with with the reveal, with the event itself. It was it had didn't have really a high energy to it, uh, other than some people that were always yelling in the crowds and interrupting uh, Elon as he was speaking. But I know that uh, it's an exciting time for many people. Um, you know, I like that he went through the history of Tesla and, and to reinforce how they got there in such a short time. And that's important for a lot of people to understand that don't follow Tesla. So I think that that was good. Um, and but obviously the focus was on the Model Y, which was announced. So it is a up to a seven seater. They call, call it an SUV now, more like a, a crossover, uh, which is what I thought it was. But, uh, you know, obviously there are small and compact SUVs as well as larger SUVs. So uh, it's definitely going after the right market space. I've been saying that for a while, that that is a hot, hot, hot market space. Well, what are some of the stats on this? Well, it's going to start price wise at about forty seven thousand dollars U.S., uh, and like in following the Model 3 footsteps, they will come up with the higher cost trim packages and options first. Um, and they will do that for quite some time. So they're going to come out with um, a, the long range version, the dual motor all wheel drive and performance variants ahead of time like they did with the Model 3, and then they'll come up with the standard range version after that. Now that standard range version is priced at $39,000 USD to start, uh, and that's a great entry point for that segment of the vehicle landscape and marketplace. So I think that that's priced very competitively. Um, so the, the Model Y can carry up to seven adults. I didn't physically go down there and sit in it. I'm sure we'll see it. There's probably already videos coming out as I speak on this from yesterday's. Uh, I don't anticipate the sixth or the, the third row to be very uh, roomy uh, as far as larger people like myself or others like that but for kids or or certainly places to put things I think it'll do quite adequately it'll have impressive uh, speeds and feeds of course zero to 60 in three and a half seconds top speed 150 miles an hour standard battery so the the one that they'll come out with um, uh, later on will be to up to 230 miles of range with the long range up to 300 miles so very similar to the model 3 uh, characteristics in their trim models in fact it's basically taking a model 3 chassis and just changing it a little bit uh, elongating it slightly adding i think about 10 inches of overall length if i remember correctly and you know increasing the rear uh the rear roof lines to accommodate that more space but inside it looks just like a model a model 3 and that's you know that's a great move for tesla because they could take something that they're already producing uh, in mass quantities and continuing to to improve that economies of scale and just offer it in a slightly different configuration it'll make their margins more healthier it'll, it'll make their achievements to be able to hit the price points at they want much more realistic by doing that so that's a smart move on them so when i saw it roll out i was it was oh it's a model 3 basically just slightly bigger uh, and that's a good move on them it's a hatchback people yay finally you get a hatchback here again um, and no exception as far as safety goes because tesla elon did talk a lot about their safety and what they want to do so to recap the lineup of the Model Ys, you're going to have the standard range, which is 230 miles, the long range at 300 miles. They'll offer a dual motor all-wheel drive equivalent of 280 mile range and a performance version with 280 mile range, just tweaked motors and all that good stuff. Um, so the long range will be starting at $47,000 US with the dual motor at $51,000 US and the performance at $60,000 US. So very similar, I think, to Model 3 segment, just a little higher. And of course, the standard range, as I mentioned, at, at $39,000. Deliveries. Well, you won't see any Model Ys on the road till at least a year from now, most likely a year and a half. They're talking about fall of 2020 for initial delivery. So I would certainly expect the Q3, maybe the early Q4 time frame, most likely early Q4 of 2020, if I were to bet on that. Um, and then the um, standard range following a year later. So the good news is you'll be able to get these in about a year and a half. The bad news is if you're holding out for that $39,000 variant, it's going to be probably two years from now. So you're going to be having to wait a lot longer. 
Um, but good on Tesla. Uh, as I say, more choice is a great thing. I'm sure there's there the videos. The internet's being flooded with videos now on the Model Y. So go check them out. And I provided, of course, some pictures during this little chat of mine. But congratulations, Tesla, and all the best. And we'll continue to follow the progress on the Model Y. Now, staying with Tesla, one story that came out, I think I reported it on the last show, I know I tweeted about it, was the store closure so that Tesla was going to uh, reduce the number of stores. Yes, they did on the last show and uh, augment that by more service centers and by hiring more people in some of the areas in the company like manufacturing and so forth. Well, there's been a change over the last week or so since that last show that they've decided that they're going to kind of hold off on finishing off their store closure plan that they originally came up with, which was to close, uh, if I uh, understand the numbers correctly, uh, about 30% of their sales locations globally they wanted to close. They've kind of uh, already done and factored in about 10% of these locations. So that's, if not, it's it's happened. And I, I, I tweeted out about some reports on, on some of the uh, uh, things going on with employees, which I won't get into here, but there, there, there have been some store closures already, uh, some sales locations. And uh, obviously they're going to relook at a lot of other locations uh, where they're going to relook at those other 20% to see if it's valid to close them depending on traffic and uh, uh, and sales and so forth and all that kind of stuff. So that's one thing about the store closures. The other thing though is they've announced that they're going to we look at that, but they're going to increase prices. So there's a 3% global price rise. Uh, that's my understanding. It doesn't take effect until March 18th, which is just a few days from now. Um, but there will be a, a small price increase globally. However, it won't impact the $35,000 or the base Model 3 model. It's more like mainly focused more on the S and the X and the higher priced vehicles. So I, I'm assuming that the higher priced Model 3 variants will have that 3% price increase as well. So um, if anybody uh, you know has an experience as far as a, a price range, uh, a price increase on these, uh, send me a note or drop me a, an email or drop me a note in the comments and let me know what you think about that. And if you've experienced in your area some store closures, I'd like to know where they are because that's one thing I have not heard is exactly what locations have been closed. I've only got a number. So it'll be interesting to find that out. So anyway, you know, uh, uh, Tesla's is a business. They got to do things to, uh, to, to make their their bottom line more efficient and uh, to get what they need to uh, now so that they can plan for the future. So best of luck to them. Switch gears to Volkswagen. You know, I can't go almost a show or two without talking about Volkswagen, folks. few articles that came out. One of them is that uh, Volkswagen is actually ordering, opening their order books a little early. And this is a, this is a European article that I'm referencing that they're going to open order books on the first full electric variant that they're coming out on their new ID platform, which I believe is the ID Nero. If I've got a Neo, if I've got that right, sorry, the hatchback. Uh, it's going to be, uh, you can put in a pre-order for that starting May 8th of, of this year. So only in about another month or so. Um, and now these are all going to be produced in Germany. These are various, these are hatchbacks based on that MEB platform that are golf like in size. Um, they are going to, so you can put a, a deposit down. I don't have a number of how much that deposit is, probably a couple of grand US, I would imagine, or a thousand bucks. The, the, the full production version is going to be unveiled at the Frankfurt Motor Show, which I believe is in May, is around that time. Um, and they are going to be making those orders available for right-hand drive customers in the UK, as well as left-hand drive uh, clients for other parts of the world. Um, and that's going to be at the same time, you'll be able to put a deposit. Now to just refresh your pricing, the ID hatchback is going to start at less than 30,000 euros. So about 26,000 pounds. I don't know what that is in Canadian or US. You can figure that out. And um, the largest battery version will you know, go up. Uh, uh, they'll have different trim levels for batteries. I think three different levels in the lineup. That'll give you a range from 550 kilometers uh, or up to 550 kilometers or 342 miles. And these are WLTP. So most likely so you can trim them down a bit for EPA. Uh, the ID Cross, as I saw in the Toronto show that I reported on, which is kind of based in a, a look, you know, kind of in a more SUV-ish Tiguan format, um, it will, will be their first fully electric SUV, and that's going to follow one year later than than the ID. So uh, probably in 2020, and then they're going to come out with more of their ID platform that they've been uh, teasing us with in 2021 and in 2022. That all really cool looking ID Buzz Volkswagen a van again or the camper van type aspect, followed by a whole slew of cars. I'm going to get into that in a second these are all based on the MEB family that can drive all these different skins that they can bolt onto these platforms to give you the different variants 
of the uh, of their fully electric vehicles. I mentioned these are all in Zwickau in Germany. That's the lead production plant. Actually, that plant is gearing up to have a capacity to produce uh, 330,000 EVs a year or vehicles a year uh, from an EV, and they're going to be producing six vehicles uh, from three different brands, uh, and that's including VW plus Audi and Skoda um, from an EV uh, landscape. So. If you're interested in putting an order in, I think that these things are going to do very well. I believe that there's going to be a lot of pre-orders for this. I, I don't think as many as the Model 3, to be honest with you, but I think there's going to be enough to really take notice uh, for, for the market, and uh, I think VW will do quite well with the ID platform. Um, so uh, good luck on that, and keep. if you do order one, let me know what kind of feedback you got, and let me know how much it costs to put a pre-order in. I'd like to understand that. Now, to fund all this expansion and to fuel the electrification on VW side, similar to what Tesla's going through and other auto manufacturers, really, folks, is Volkswagen has also announced up to $7,000, 7,000 job cuts, excuse me, in this from a worldwide uh, viewpoint that I'm understanding here, uh, just because they want to invest, they and they are investing so heavily in electrification to develop more electric vehicles. So they need to recoup some costs by lowering their their uh, maintenance, you know, their, their manual costs um, in in employees to cut up to up to seven thousand jobs by twenty twenty three. So this is a four year rollout plan. This isn't an immediate. Hey, you're gone tomorrow. Have a nice life. Like I've heard from other people, um, this is going to take some time and it should. They anticipate that it's going to lower their operating costs by almost six billion pounds or almost seven billion U.S., I believe, is the equivalent on that. Um, now, you read into that, and it sounds really negative, obviously. But when you dig into it a little bit more, uh, they do come back and say that most of the job cuts are expected to be carried out, out through retirement offers or through normal attrition that would that would be occurring anyway, or they might just speed it up a little bit. And it, they've actually estimated that they have about eleven thousand employees that are eligible for retirement in twenty nineteen. So they're only going to look at um, at look at retiring about you know five to seven thousand of those eleven thousand that are eligible now. Many may just opt to take retirement on their own and not have to be asked for that. Many uh, that, that reach those points. Again, this is over the next uh, three to four years, folks. Uh, and also in parallel to that, VW is planning on adding 2,000 more jobs in research and development. So we may see a shift. We may see uh, some shift in, in movement internally with people. I don't know. Um, if anybody is part of the VW group and is and wants to reach out to me and let me know how they're how they're impacted, I'd like to know. Without you can remain anonymous and not give away any trade secrets, of course. But uh, let me know how how they they deal with you over the next little time. Uh, probably won't be for a little bit of time, but uh, it'll be it'll be nice to know. So uh, you know, it's again, it's just you know, putting money where they need to. Volkswagen has been shelling out a lot of dough and, and signing up a lot of contracts for big big deals both for battery and suppliers and all these other supply chain issues that they need to resolve before they get into producing cars they've been doing a lot of that so they just need to reshuffle things around so they can continue with their electrification focus now that focus also continues with an announcement that they had of uh, planning to build so many cars in so many years and originally it was uh, along the lines when when he first started talking about Volkswagen a year or so ago they they were talking that gee over the next 10 12 15 years we're going to build about 15 million cars well now they want to juice that up to 22 million over the next 10 years and it's a very ambitious plan and uh that's you know, a dramatic increase in the number of models uh you know previously to do that they were planning about 50 models to reach those numbers but now they're going to increase that to about 70 different models and remember folks uh vw does isn't just one company they have about a dozen brands under the vw W Group label, including its own, and a lot of those EVs that we're already seeing. Uh, I talked about some of them on the last show, and I'll talk about another one on this show. Um, these, this MEB platform coming to fruition for some of their other brands. Uh, and these brands include, of course, VW, Audi, Seat, and Skoda. Um, and again, all that MEB toolkit. And one thing I think I mentioned on the last show or a couple before is that Volkswagen is also going to be able to make being um, made available this MEB toolkit, MEB platform, 
um, for other auto manufacturers if they want to build their own vehicles based on that platform. So similar to like what Tesla did in opening patents and allowing to help spur EV adoption. And that's one thing that Elon said last night that I was very impressed with is that he acknowledged the fact that they've helped to grow the market, which they have. There's no doubt that they have, that they've uh, been able to really achieve that fact in helping to grow the EV market uh, almost singularly. But all this, all these other companies that are getting in, he even said, like, we've opened patents because we need more guys doing it. We've always had that attitude that it's not just us, it's other manufacturers that need to get into this. So for all those guys that are on blogs and websites, and I continue to try to you know, tell the story about more and more and more, it's not one brand, one brand, one brand. It's not Tesla that's going to save mankind, but we need... They're the spark, and we need all these other guys to get into it. So I'm really happy that uh, that Elon alluded to that and mentioned it um, at his uh, Model Y reveal last night. So VW, big plans. Uh, again, they're stepping up. They continue to announce this stuff. There's a lot of skeptics out there because I see it in comments. I see it on websites. I see people saying, ah, VW's full of crap. They're only diesel gate. They don't care. I don't trust them. They got to dig themselves out of that hole, that hole somewhere. Uh, somehow, folks, you got to give them a chance. You got to read and dig into what they're doing there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that you may not see in in a couple of websites or reading on a post or two you need to really understand the big picture of what vw is doing and they've been spending massive amounts of money so give them a break and see what happens but i'm very very excited about vw and i think the kind of getting an idea of the number of reservations for the id coming up this year may set a good tone of what we expect from them and uh, so continue to watch what's going on Staying in autos, uh, some more stuff still popping out here. I guess remnants from the auto shows. One of them was the Mini Cooper SE uh, EV version uh, that I talked to somebody, uh, not this car show in Toronto, but last year's car show. You may remember that interview when they had one of the prototypes there at the show, which was pretty cool. Well, there's some more stuff going on for Mini because they plan to launch their electrified Mini version by the end of this year. So they got to be doing something to get there. And it looks like some of these things have been spotted testing in Munich. Munich, uh, Germany, at one of the off-road driving events uh, at the Munich driving at BMW's Munich Driving Center. There we go. That's what I was trying to find. So they got a prototype out there buzzing around in, in so, sort of camel gear. Now they're basing it that's going to be based on the uh, BMW's uh, i3 platform to a point, as far as look the electrified, the batteries and the powertrain goes on the uh, the i3s, which should include a 135 kilowatt, 181 horsepower motor and a 94 amp hour, 33 kilowatt hour battery. Um, the battery is a 96 cell lithium ion unit from Chinese CATL um, instead of probably using BMW Samsung supplier and then there's some other specs there. Um, now this will be a three door model that's buzzing around so two doors with a hatch to give it the three doors and the production line will be in Oxford England that's where all these will be produced. Um, there's no other stats confirmed yet for the uh, for the Mini E or the uh, uh, Mini EV whatever you want to call it. Um, it's got a working range that they're guessing of 120 or so miles, and that would make sense because that would follow into the Honda E footsteps of that 125 mile urbanish kind of. Yeah, I can boot around town and out from London to some parts north and back and you know, boot around the city quite easily with that kind of range. And I think that's kind of where they're leaning towards from that, and it makes sense. And that's it. No pricing, no other details, other than they are hoping to launch these by the end of the year. So stay tuned, and if anybody uh, has any more intel about BMW and the Mini stuff that's going on there for the Mini E, uh, please send me an email or drop me a note, and uh, I'm not aware that they've opened any reservations or anything for this platform yet, uh, but if you hear something, please let me know. And a couple of latecomers coming out of the Geneva Car Show still is the Skoda Vision 4 concept, and uh, this actually looks a lot better than a concept this looks like a pretty close production vehicle again a skoda brand being vw based on that meb platform it's an all-electric crossover coupe um hope hoping to get into the market relatively soon by about 2020 so about before the end of next year they're going to be producing these folks and they as you can see by these pictures and videos they have a driving prototype now the car is, as i mentioned is based on meb's VW's MEV platform. It's supposed to have a concept ranges here that they expect that they gave out. 500 kilometers, 311 miles of WLTP range, 83 kilowatt hour battery, liquid cool, liquid thermal, thermal management, dual motor, so all wheel drive. So that gives it that crossover or compact kind of crossover feel and 
um, handling capabilities, being all-wheel drive. Power output of 225 kilowatts or 306 uh, PS, which I forget how that translates into horsepower. Somebody will have to do that for me. 0 to 100 kilometers or 0 to 62 miles an hour in about 5.9 seconds, so really good zip. Acceleration from 80 to 120 in less than 4 seconds, so great for that passing kind of stuff. Top speed 180 kilometers an hour, 112 miles an hour, and, and your typical fast charging in 30 minutes, uh, 80%, and so forth. So no other specs other than it's, it's a really nice looking machine. Um, I don't see those, obviously, if those camera mirrors coming to North America. I'm not aware if, if, if Skoda is still shipping in any parts of North America. I know they used to be here in Canada, but I'm not 100% sure if they still are because I don't I don't see them, but I'm not looking for them either. Um, but I think, again, they're going to do well with this, and it's nice to see more electrification from other manufacturers and uh, utilizing that common platform from VW to get these vehicles out there. So stay tuned. Again, anybody who has more information on that, please let me know. Finally, on the car side, I've got smart to talk about they've unveiled at the geneva motor show recently one of these ones that you got to hug again like last time like the fiat <laughs> it's called the smart four e's plus uh, f-o-r-e-a-s-e plus four e's plus um, not much stats on it this was kind of a concept but again we're seeing a lot of these concepts be a little bit more in tune with reality nowadays that uh, seems to be that they are building these with a lot of production specs in mind and production viewpoints so this is based on the smart eq 42 cabrio uh, vehicle that's there now and, and which means that it probably will be equipped with a 17.6 kilowatt hour battery and a 60 kilowatt motor so nothing earth shattering but for a little inter urban zipper to get you around uh, certainly something that can do that now remember folks smart plans on uh, going all electric with all their with their platform starting from next year from 2020 onwards as they make the smith the switch to pure electric vehicles for both their 42 and their 44 models so their entire model line will be electric no other specs pricing etas all that other stuff uh, given at this point so stay tuned but uh, if this is something that's of interest to you you can check out their websites and uh, follow them and if you do hear again as always if anybody hears more info send it my way and i'll uh, tell the rest of the folks a couple follows up to the last show um and then some i've got some email finally and some questions to ask uh, that i'm going to answer but one of them was when i talked in the last show about nissan's um, imq concept about the e-power i was a little off in my description on e-power so i just wanted to set the record straight i want to thank some of the viewers for their comments and uh, an email for uh, helping me point me in the right direction i didn't have all the info so just the to, to remember that e-power is driven by a gasoline engine an internal combustion engine that charges the battery and then the battery is connected to the inverter on the, you look at this diagram behind me here the battery is connected to the inverter which is connected to the motor which is connected to the axle and the wheels and all that good stuff so it's driven by the motor the the uh, internal combustion motor but the drivetrain is electrified so you get all the the benefits of that electrified trans uh, drivetrain in instant torque and you know, uh, better handling and all that good stuff, but you do have a motor that drives it. So the, the gas engine is not connected to the wheels from a powertrain. So I wanted to make sure that you understood that because that's different than some conventional hybrids, which, which can do that. The gas engine can power the wheels or a, a battery, small battery with, with a motor can power the wheels. So it can shift on a conventional one. Um, it does have a tailpipe, right? So because it has a nice engine in it, internal combustion, it has a tailpipe. So it does spew some emissions. So remember that. But it does deliver a similar experience as a battery electric vehicle because of that, uh, because of the platform, the electrified platform is what's powering it and moving it. Now the engine apparently charges when necessary, and I had to do a lot of digging to, to understood what that means. It's not right in your face, and I kind of wish that Nissan and many manufacturers, it's not just Nissan, would be a little bit more upfront with their specs and what they mean by things, especially when they're they're um, inventing these new buzzwords and concepts and and you know tagging them in, from a marketing standpoint. So. What it means is that it's, I mentioned that it was similar to the Chevy Volt with a V in operations. Um, but the difference is that the Volt has a plug-in. So you can actually plug it in, charge the battery, run in battery only in the Volt for a while. Then the engine will kick in and charge the battery when you need it to. But the idea of the Volt is that it's encouraged, it, it, because it's a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, it encourages you to run it as much as you can on battery only 
and then use the engine as when you need to. So it gives you that extra range, no range anxiety, all that other stuff. And it acts as a generator, so it uses less fuel. So typically, like the i3 uh, Rex, as an example, they have very small engines and very small fuel tanks, like, you know, maybe seven gallon or something like that, or even less. Um, very, very small. So because the engine is just really just running in an idle type mode, at an optimum RPM to generate, uh, to, to power the generator, which powers, sends electricity to the battery to keep it charged. Um, now, as, as an example for the note that I compared this to, the engine runs at about a constant 2500 RPM. Uh, and that's a sweet spot for efficiency. So when that engine's running, uh, but it's a small battery. On the note, it's a 1.5, 1.5 kilowatt hour, very small battery. And I suspect on this IMQ, it'll be bigger than that, but probably not a whole lot bigger because the concept is still this e-power. So the engine does turn on and off as needed. So that is a little bit of a differentiator uh, with there. So that's probably more towards your conventional hybrids that will have the start stop assist elements when you maybe stop at a light, the engine stops, and then you can get going a little bit on battery only mode until, until you hit a speed and the engine kicks in or you, you throw up on the accelerator, the engine kicks in and you go, you get a little bit of uh, EV boost, but the engine kicks in sooner, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's kind of how the e-power works. It's a little bit of a mix of a 100% electric vehicle and a conventional hybrid vehicle just spun a little bit differently. But the main point to that is it does not have a plug. And as I've said in this show many, many times, I'm all about having a plug in the car. At least plug-in hybrids are very useful as a stopgap to get us to full battery-only zero emission vehicles at some point when all that choice and all that other good stuff is there. Because I'm all about educating minds one tailpipe at a time, right folks? I mentioned that last time and thanks for the feedback on that. So I wanted to just set the record straight on Nissan's e-power and what how that works. Let me get to the mailbag. And Today's mailbag makes a couple of different forms of it. Uh, it's actually coming from some comments and some Twitter examples. Um, so I've got a couple of those here that I'll talk about. And one of them was um, a gentleman was uh, that I would just, I've been on a lot of forums trying to talk to people about cost of EVs because everybody, you know, it's, it's easy to jump, hey, buy an EV. You're going to save a lot of money on fuel. You're going to save a lot of money on all this stuff. And it's really worth it to, you know, it's much cheaper to, to operate it to run. Well, you're absolutely correct. It is. In most cases, the vast majority of cases, uh, a full battery electric vehicle is much cheaper to operate than an, the, an equivalent internal combustion vehicle. It does depend on your local gas prices. It does depend on your, your local generator or, or electricity prices because some areas of the world, they're quite high. It also depends on where that is, electricity is coming from. If that electricity is from a very dirty source, then it doesn't, you know, it might save you money, but it's not the right thing to do from an environment aspect. So you've got to look at these and drill down a little bit far, farther. You can't just arbitrarily say, yeah, an EV is going to be cheaper because it may not be the case. But barring that aside, there's some other costs that you have to look at. And this one gentleman, you know, telling me that he spent 300 bucks a month for gas and uh, didn't have the oil changes and all that stuff. So, yes, there's a savings. And then another gentleman on some of the comments uh, mentioned about the costing against a Toyota Camry for equivalent. This is, I think, in reference to a Model 3 uh, that we need charging times to be closer to refueling like ice cars and, and then, you know, cars depreciate and and battery replacement costs if you need to do it and all this kind of stuff and cost of acquisition is still higher than a gas power car and that's the one I wanted to zoom in so um, and a few things so you're absolutely correct in these statements um, cost of acquisition is something a lot of people don't think about when they're comparing when they're looking at a return on the investment when I talk about ROI uh, return on that investment total cost of ownership is a little bit different it's looking at if I'm going to keep this car for 10 years how much is it going to cost me versus another car for 10 years and you just add up all the numbers. I'm not going to get into TCO because there's so many factors that change that, right? You know, if you buy an EV um, versus at 35,000 versus an ICE at 35,000 and you finance it, you put a hundred bucks down and you finance it for five years, your payments are still going to be the same, right? Your insurance is probably going to be slightly cheaper on an EV, but it could almost be a wash depending on where you are driving all that stuff. So, so and, and interest on that loan is going to be very similar. So I don't, I don't get into that and I don't get into depreciation because um, I, I know for me as personally, when I buy a car, I keep it until I drive it to the ground. So I don't give 
a rat's whatever about depreciation. It means nothing to me. I don't lease because I'm not worried about flipping it. When you lease something, you never own it, right? You're just making payments and then you flip it, you get something else and you're making payments. So you don't really have any equity or ownership. I'd rather buy, keep it, drive it to the ground. And then when I'm ready, use either give it away or trade it in and get a couple of bucks for it and get something else and, and get the full, as much full life out of it as possible. And cars now, you know, new cars now, even ICE fees, I mean, they're built now to last 10 years. I remember 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, it was hard to get a car to last 10 years, especially in areas that have winter climates where we put salt and crap on the roads that the cars start rusting before they're two years old and the bottoms fall out of them and the engines crap out. I mean, that those days are kind of gone. All these cars that come out from all the, the main manufacturers uh, and even some of the tier twos are built pretty darn good. And that includes electric and ice vehicles that's that's a round opinion so it's easy to get an ice vehicle to last you 10 years from a longevity um of a, a viewpoint so what i want to focus on quickly on this part is the upfront costs so looking at the return on that investment um, on an EV versus an ICE-V. And I'm going to use my own Nissan LEAF as an example. I will be doing a more detailed financial breakdown on that in my one year review of my LEAF coming up in May, but I haven't, but I've been, you know, sharing some information with other people as I go along. So, and there's two ways to look at this. If you get incentives or if you don't get incentives, and that's key to looking at an ROI or return on that investment. So here's an example with my leaf, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be very fast on this as much as I can, folks. Um, with incentives, my leaf, um, uh, the, the leaf price with tax in for the model that I got last year was fifty one thousand, and I'm rounding slightly up here, folks. Was fifty one thousand dollars Canadian. I was lucky enough to get the fourteen thousand dollar provincial incentive at that time, and a small dealer discount as well that they added onto that. So my tax in price out the door with all the admin fees and license fees and gas tax and air conditioning tax and all the crap that they throw on you was about $35,500. That's what my out the door price was on my LEAF for the LEAF SL, the loaded trim of the 40 kilowatt hour LEAF 2018. Looking at the time to an ICE V version of a similar comparable car, I could look at a Kia Soul as an example. It's got similar room, it's got a similar hatch, it's got you know, he's got tech, it's got all these other, some driver's aids, it's got all this other stuff. So their, their top of the line model out the door was about $35,000 as well. So is there cost parity to be worried about there? No. Those incentives brought my price down close enough to an equivalent ICE uh, V vehicle that it made perfect sense to go with an EV right away. Um, and uh, not only that, but I'm going to start recoup. I'm going to start making money or recu saving a lot more money, recuperating um, uh, money right away versus in another case, which I'll get to you, because of the lower fuel costs and the lower operating costs. You know, less maintenance. My insurance was slightly less uh, than a newer car of the same equivalent, and so forth. Uh, so, but again, insurance is going to be relative to where you are and some other factors. So that made sense. Now, if I look at that same example, and um, I, if I were to try to get that today without any incentives here in Ontario, this is how that scenario would look. That same car, instead of being $35,500, um, is now $50,200. Uh, it's still at $51,000. Uh, there's no uh, $14,000 off. Uh, I add my, loyal, my dis dealer discount, the same one he gave me, add some taxes and all the other crap to it, and it's about $50,200. Well, that's a difference. So again, comparing that to a similar price ICE fee at $35,000, that's a difference of about $15,200. Okay, so you're going, well, so what? So you got to pay $15,000 more. Hey, you're saving all this money on fuel and maintenance and all that stuff. Well, you're right. But let's break down those numbers. So right now, it, it's looking like my average cost for me for a year to charge the leaf, and that includes 98% or so, 99% home charging, charging off hours, utilizing the best rates, as well as 
a dozen or so fast charging runs a year. I may get more fast charging, but I've only done about a hand, about seven right now since I've had the car, and I'm coming up on a year soon. So I haven't really done a lot of fast charging, but I am going to be doing a bit more as I travel more in that vehicle. So if I round that up, you know, uh, I'm key, I am keeping track of, of my uh, charging costs, and as I said, folks, I'll, I'll give you guys a synopsis in, on the one year review, full synopsis, but based on 24,000 kilometers per year of driving, cost me about a thousand bucks Canadian. I'm rounding it up a little bit. My maintenance cost so far has been nothing, so I'm saving on that. Uh, therefore, my yearly op cost, op, my cost to operate the vehicle, taking away insurance, taking away any financing payments or any of that, that stuff. I'm not looking at depreciation, as I mentioned, just purely looking at the hard costs right now for me is a thousand bucks because even if I didn't get the, if I got the key, my payments are going to be about the same. The interest rate's about the same, and you can negotiate insurance about the same. So those those are kind of a bit of a wash. So you can't really factor that in. Yes, there's going to be some depreciation. Leaf might depreciate more than others, but as I mentioned, that doesn't. It's not a care for me uh, to worry about. Now, looking at a comparable ICE V, which we have, we have a subcompact Nissan as well. Uh, you know, a little 1.8 engine in it, nothing fancy. Uh, I was driving that for four years prior to getting the Leaf, so I know it very well what the capabilities are, and that cost about 50 bucks a week for us to put fuel into that. So if you do the math, that's about 2,600 bucks a year. These are all Canadian prices for fuel. Oil changes. Now, in this case, I do do it myself. Um, the cars are older; they're they're all off a of warranty. So I go out and I buy uh, some full synthetic fuel and that lasts about 12, 15,000 kilometers per change. So I, I can limit it to two, to a two change uh, oil change a year. And even when I had the car, I was only doing two anyway because I'm running full synthetic. So let's say about 150 bucks to do that. Um, and then maintenance. Well, yes, there's going to be other maintenance that comes up. It, it's really hit and miss, right? I, I went a couple of years without having to worry about anything on these cars, after, even after the warranty expired on that car. I never had anything wrong, but other than putting gas and changing the oil and rotating the tires and but just using those those real life examples uh, on my ice feet would cost me about two thousand seven hundred fifty dollars canadian per year to operate it in an ideal situation uh, so the cost difference is about uh, seventeen fifty per year. It would be higher to run the ice fee versus the BEF, and that gives me a so if I take that seventeen fifty savings that I have by not driving the ice fee now that I'm driving the EV and I divide that into the co the higher cost for the EV that I had to pay up front uh, which in this case would have been 15,200 it gives me about 8.6 and that that's the bottom line number that I'm trying to get to in this example is my return on that investment so things staying equal now obviously there's going to be some maintenance some other maintenance costs that comes up brakes won't last as long on an ice fee as they do on, on a BEV. I know that. Uh, there may be other repairs, an alternator, this, that, you know, struts. I mean, there may be things that happen. EVs do have similar components, right? They do have suspension. They do have boots and all this kind of stuff that there are some things that have to be maintained. You have to change the brake fluid every couple of years on an EV. It's not magically going to last you forever either. So there are some things to look at, but the majority of the maintenance is much lower. So I'm not factoring that in, but if I just factored in my 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 light cost as i just mentioned is about eight and a half or so year return on that investment so that means that i've had to pay fifteen thousand dollars higher for this ev versus a comparable car and it's going to take me about eight years of running it to recoup that money back based on the savings that i'm getting from the the EV. Um, and again, that can be a lot less. It could be six to seven years when you start factoring some of the other things that ICE Vs uh, can happen to you as far as repairs and maintenance goes. And that's not including tires and all that stuff, things that are wearable. They're going to wear on both models. Um, you know, if you need to get another set of tires, you need to get another set of tires versus an ICE V or an EV. It doesn't matter. You still got to get tires. So, you know, this is just kind of taking into really forced maintenance that I, that I know I would have to do on this car. So that gives you the TCO numbers, and that's going to be higher or lower depending on what the cost difference is between the car. So if you looked at a, premium, let's say maybe a Performance Model 3 and a 300 series BMW X Drive, whatever equivalent that's going to be, you can price it out, look at the difference, and figure out your own ROI. Maybe the Model 3, maybe you're getting some incentives that'll bring that price down so your ROI is much sooner or even almost immediate. Or it might be a longer ROI. So those are the kind of numbers you got to look at when you're really comparing battery electric vehicles to ICE vehicles. So I would encourage you to use your own examples, uh, find what you can, 
But just be careful because I see a lot of people and they're not wrong by saying EVs cost less. Uh, so um, operating rise, they, they cost a lot less. That's 100% true in most cases. But just to say arbitrarily that they cost less than an ICE-V is not 100% accurate. You really do need to look at each example on its own merit. So the big, the big item that's a change here uh, that can affect this, folks, is that cost parity. And we don't have it yet. Right? I've been talking about cost parity for quite some time. I still think it's five to seven years away. I know that some, some Bloomberg and some other guys think it's going to be happening in 2022, which is only about three years away. Hey, I hope it's it's happening sooner, but I just don't see it yet until we see more and more manufacturers on the road with vehicles, which will help drive the battery supplier prices down because they'll be cranking up more and hitting those higher economies of scale. And through competition as well, they're going to want to be able to price their cars a little better to, to sway the market, to get people into their EV these as they start to continue to invest. So something has to give and cost parity does have to happen eventually. And I would encourage you to look at that and let me know your feedback because um, again, I'm just, I'm not trying to bash one versus another. I'm, you know me guys and gals, I'm trying to get everybody, I'm trying to get, you know, bums into seats of EVs. That's my, right? Get, you know, uh, get people out of tailpipes, get them into a plug somehow. That's what I'm all about. But you've got to be realistic when you're talking to people about the facts. So a Tesla may not be the cheapest example for somebody or a Leaf may not be or a Bolt or whatever uh, may not be. So you've got you've got to look at their case and be able to help break it down. And hopefully this was some good information to do that. And last and quick before I'm done with the show, I just want to again, uh, here's a picture of our of the win my winner that I had for my first uh, charity raffle that I did uh, just uh, after the Christmas holidays or just a little bit later after Christmas. This is Marcel Ward. He finally got my stuff. I shipped that like two months ago and I felt so bad that it just took forever to get to the UK uh, to where Marcel is. And here's his picture showing off his nice EV Revolution cap and mug and of course the uh, Model 3. Uh, luggage set that he got uh, from uh, Oscar and Hamish, which he's, he thanks me for and he really enjoys it, says it's great stuff. And again, thank everybody that participated in that. I will look to do something else this year for charity. But uh, again, thanks Marcel for that. And I'm really glad that you got the stuff. All right, that's it for this edition, episode 35, the EV Revolution Show. Closing, I'm going to continue to close with Fully Charged Live. If you're not aware, uh, it, this stuff, it's on behind me. There's the UK one coming on uh, January june 7th to june 9th of this year in silverstone north of london in the uk tickets are now on sale they've been on sale i think for the last week or so so please go out and get your tickets for that i will be there and i look to shake hands and see people and tell uh, hear all kinds of stories and uh, help with that energy and help to educate people out there and also don't forget the u.s uh, side to this the from in the fall of this year september 7th and 8th in austin texas will be fully charged live the usa version uh, tickets are not on sale yet i am hearing that we should start seeing tickets go up by the early to middle part of april so keep checking their websites for more information and uh, i encourage you once they go once those tickets go on sale, please jump right in there, folks, and get your tickets because that's going to be an awesome event. Uh, and I'm definitely going to be down at that event as well since I'm kind of helping these guys out, doing some background planning and stuff for them. Uh, so good. So a lot of action happening on Fully Charged. So please, if you're interested, attend those events. And uh, I hope, look forward to seeing you out there. And as I mentioned, that's it for the EV Revolution show. Thanks, everybody, for watching. It's always a pleasure to do these shows and especially to, to get the feedback through comments and email. Really appreciate that. If you like the show, please tell other people about it. Get them to subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, please do. I would appreciate that you would do that and like it if you want to um, and continue to follow my adventures in the EV Revolution landscape. A thank you coming up for my Patreon supporters. Uh, I'm always humbled, of course, for that. And until the next show, please, everybody out there, stay safe. All the best. And we'll see you on the next side. Bye-bye.